Hello and welcome to another Dusty Hue tutorial video, although this one's going to be a little different. Rather than a step-by-step -step tutorial, we're actually going to take a step right back and discuss one of the fundamental principles of the Dusty Hue workflow, which is how we go about generating morphs for our character. Now, for those that are new to the Dusty Hue workflow, uh, I do go over this process as a step-by-step -step tutorial albeit it's um, a very basic example way back in part two of the original tutorial series. While the tools themselves have evolved a bit since that was recorded, which was almost a year ago now, the, the basic workflow hasn't changed. And uh, I think you'll still get some value out of watching that original tutorial series to get up to speed. I'll leave a link in the description for that video as well. And for those who are already familiar with the Dusty Who workflow, this video might still give you some tips um, on how we can use the flexibility that the workflow allows in order to create different types of morphs for our character. With almost all other Daz Studio exporting workflows out there, for example, the Daz to Maya bridge, you would typically select the morphs that you want to export at the time of exporting, uh, and they would be included in the FBX file that gets generated. And for a lot of cases with a lot of morphs, that would work fine. But there are scenarios where that isn't ideal. And in order to understand why, we need to talk a little bit about the different methods available for skinning 3D characters. So here I have this simple Houdini scene that I'm going to use to try and illustrate the different skinning methods, uh, as well as the problems with using just the morphs that come out of Daz Studio if you export them with the FBX file. Skinning in the context of 3D characters basically refers to how the vertices of the character's geometry move with the underlying skeleton. And there are different skinning methods available, so different uh, algorithms are used to determine how those vertices move with the skeleton. But the two most common ones you will come across are linear skinning and dual quaternion skinning. Now, Daz Studio uses the dual quaternion method, whereas Unreal Engine Unity and most 3D game engines will use the linear skinning method. I believe the underlying maths is simpler and therefore faster to calculate. So that's probably the reason why. Now, before people shout at me in the comments, I understand it is possible to get dual quaternion skinning working in Unreal Engine. However, the fact that it doesn't come natively with the engine or that it's undocumented and somewhat hidden away suggests to me that Epic is very much focused on the linear skinning method. And I think it's fair to say that probably most games that are created would use the linear skinning method for their characters. So what are the differences between the two methods? Well, if we take a look at this knee on both the linear skinned uh, figure and the dual quaternion skinned figure, we can see that the dual quaternion method does a much better job at preserving volume of the character's geometry when the skeleton is bent at extreme angles. Uh, and it also does a better job at preserving volume when the joints are twisted. Whereas if we have a look at the linear skin method, we can see that in this pose, the knee basically collapses completely. There's no longer any volume defining the knee shape. And it's a similar scenario when you twist bones, you get what's called a candy wrapper effect. So going back to that core principle of the Dusty Hue workflow, the first challenge it tries to solve is how we can generate corrective morphs that are optimized for this linear skinning method rather than this dual quaternion method. And in very basic terms, it does this by referencing an Alambit cached version of the figure. This gets exported out of Does Studio along with the original FBX file. Now the Alambit cached version is considered the, the ground truth, if you like. It's exactly how the figure's geometry deforms in Does Studio in various poses. And so one of the jobs of Dusty Hue is to calculate what morph is required to get from this geometry to this geometry. And so the differences in the vertices on the geometry are what ultimately become the generated morphs. On the right here, I set this up so that we can actually toggle between the different skinning methods and also apply the corrective morph for this specific pose exactly as it comes out of Daz Studio. So if we take a look at the knee here, the moment it's set to dual quaternion skinning. And if I apply the corrective morph that comes out of Daz for when the figure is in this pose, you can see that it matches our alambic cache exactly. And I can um, position it so that they're overlapping. They line up pretty much perfectly. 
However, if I change the skidding method to linear, so as it would be in Unreal Engine, and apply the same corrective morph that comes straight out of Jazz Studio, you can see it looks nothing like our Lambic cache, so our ground truth. Remember, this is what we are trying to reach by applying morphs. In fact, it actually makes things worse. It collapses the knee even further. The reason for that is because the changes in vertices required to get from this dual Quaternion skinned version to our ground truth are very different to the changes in vertices required to get from our linear skinned method to our ground truth. And so we can actually dive into the Dusty Hue network here and visualize the changes in vertex positions required in order to make the linear skin version uh, reach that ground truth. This is typically called the delta of the vertices, indicated by the green lines here. And we can also change the view so that we are actually seeing the corrective morph applied in real time. And I can toggle that on or off. So here we have, again, the uh, the linear skinned character with no corrective morph applied. If I apply the corrective morph, see we reach that ground truth with proper knee deformation. So just to recap before we move on, as it's an important principle to grasp, the whole method relies on calculating corrective morphs that will allow the linear skin geometry to reach the target alambic case geometry, i.e. the ground truth. And because of that fundamental principle, it actually allows us to do some interesting things uh, along the way. Um, basically, anything you can do to alter the geometry of our ground truth, so our lambic cached version of our character, you can use to turn into a morph. And we'll go into that in a little more detail next. So the next question would probably be, how do we go about defining which morphs we want to generate for our figure? And the answer to that is that we use something that I call a range of motion animation, which is basically an animation inside Dash Studio on the timeline here, where every frame of the animation will end up as a generated morph in the Dash to Hue workflow. And there's really only two things you need to keep in mind. The first is that, as with all Dash to Hue aspects, frame zero of our animation must be the character's default rest position. And you can make sure it is by just going up to Edit, Figure, Zero, Figure Pose. But from frame one onwards, you are free to put the character into any pose you like and therefore generate any morph you like per frame. So you can see here I have a couple of frames dedicated to bending this left shin back. And I could just have the one going from the rest position right to the extreme bent position. Um, typically, if your range of motion, in this case for the shin, is quite large, I, I typically break it up into sections. And then when that's driven, when those morphs are driven by a pose driver as an Unreal Engine, you typically get a, a smoother deformation as it as the shin bends back. But you don't have to, as I say, you could go straight from a rest pose to the extreme. But it's not limited to just joint corrective morphs. The exact same principle for facial morphs, for example. So you can see on this frame, I have the character just smiling. And again, at the end of the stage two workflow, we would have a morph with the character in this smiling pose that we could use however we like. And again, it's the same principle for full body morphs. So here I have the character with a heavy morph applied. And again, at the end of does to workflow, we would have a morph. In my case, I've called it heavy. But at this point, it's worth mentioning the other limitation of this workflow, which is currently you can't use morphs that alter the skeleton. So whilst this is a full body morph, it's not actually changing the underlying skeleton. Whereas if I was to use a morph, say like the youth morph, that wouldn't work because this morph actually is changing the underlying skeleton specifically the scale or the positions of the underlying bones. Now, this is a limitation I am hoping to overcome in future, um, and I have had some success uh, with getting these types of morphs working, but the workflow for it isn't currently straightforward, and there are some issues with it that I want to try and solve before I release that out into the wild. 
I just know that I am hoping that some point in the future we can use any morph we like, even ones that alter the skeleton. So it really is just those two things you need to keep in mind when putting your range of motion animation together. Frame zero must be the character's rest pose, and we can't currently use morphs which alter the uh, skeleton in any way. Other than that, you are free to alter the figure in any way you like in order to create a morph. So another benefit of this method is you can actually combine multiple morphs inside of Daz Studio into a single morph in Unreal Engine. So if I have a look at this frame that I've set up for our range of motion file, here I've applied a bunch of changes to the character's head and teeth and eyes, etc. Um, if I look at the currently used morphs, there's quite a few going on. So rather than having to export all of these morphs separately and then recombine them inside Unreal Engine, the end of this workflow, we will have a single morph that put the character's head into this pose, basically. So as I mentioned earlier, we are free to use any of the tools available to us, either inside Daz Studio or inside Houdini or any other DCC package. Any tools that alter the character's geometry, if we can get those alterations into our Lambic cache, then we will, at the end of the workflow, have a morph that will reach that target shape. So this isn't a great example, I admit, but it does illustrate the point. Uh, and here I've used just a deformer field in Daz Studio to lift the character's skull up into this cone shape. Uh, but you could use these deformer fields to do things like um, creating shapes for breast jiggle physics, for example, if you don't happen to have any existing morphs available in your content library. So just to recap this part of the core principles of the Daz Studio morph generation workflow, Every frame on our timeline, which I call the ROM or the range of motion animation, will end up as a morph in Unreal Engine. And really the only two things you need to keep in mind are that frame zero must be the character's reference pose or rest position, uh, and we can't use morphs that alter the skeleton at this stage. Other than that, you are free to alter the character's geometry in any way you like, and that should carry through the workflow nicely. So here we are back inside Houdini with our Toasty Hue network set up. Uh, and you can see I have the range of motion file I just showed you that's been exported out of Daz Studio. We have our corrective morphs for our knee here. We have our smiling morph here. Again, if I change the view to the default, we can actually see it with the, with the morph applied. We have our heavy morph. We have what I'm calling the jump scare morph. And you can see we have that cone head morph that uh, we use the deformer to create in Daz Studio. Now, the downside of this method is that the Daz to Hue tools don't know what you want to call these morphs because they don't get exported with any names, unlike when you just export the morph using the traditional tools. Um, it would take on the morph name that comes out of Daz, uh, comes out of Daz Studio. However, with this method, there are no names available. So the tedious part of this workflow is that you do have to name your morphs. And that's done on the pose asset node. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because, as I said earlier, it is covered uh, in previous tutorials I've done. But you do have to go through and name, basically give a name to every frame on the animation or really every morph target we're generating. There are different sections um, for morphs. Uh, retargeting is used. Or retargeting poses, um, frame zero being one of them, which is our rest pose. Um, but you can add other retargeting poses, if, for example, the uh, the target metahumans or the the mani skeleton. Joint corrective morph section is all about just that joint corrective morphs. Face section is dedicated for facial morphs. So in this case, our smile morph. We have a section for physics morphs, which are things like um, breast jiggle physics, for example. And finally, we have a full body morph section. Partially, they're split up just for ease of use and convenience. I think it just it helps when you're putting your timeline together to group, for example, all of your joint corrective morphs at the start and then move on to your facial morphs and et cetera. So that really is the downside, I suppose, of this workflow is having to um, map every frame to a named morph. But on the plus side, you only have to do it once. You can save it as a preset. And I provide all these presets with the complete version of Dusty Hue. 
but you can obviously save your own if you have added custom morph to the end of the uh, animation timeline. There are tools to help speed up the process as well in terms of duplicating groups of morphs and mir mirroring them from left to right. So it's not that bad when you get the hang of it. Different morph groups have different calculation methods available, which I don't really want to get into in this um, video, um, but there's just something to be aware of. Um, so try and correct your morphs. They can either be individual or additive. And on facial morphs, you can calculate from the rest pose, so frame zero, or the animated pose, you can choose between them. And they can also be generated as either individual or additive morphs. And the choices really depend on how you intend to uh, apply the morphs in Unreal Engine. So just to really drive home the point I made earlier about being able to use any tools available to us to alter that alambic cache reference and therefore generate morphs off of that. Here I have added uh, another frame to the timeline. So this frame didn't exist in Daz Studio. I added it in Houdini and I used some of Houdini's native tools, which I'm not going to go into in this video, but basically it was the vellum cloth tools just to pull the sleeves of this jumper up a bit. And really this is just to demonstrate that we can use Houdini's own tools to create morphs outside of Jazz Studio. And Houdini has a lot of powerful tools available that we can work with. And the only rule we have to follow when using Houdini's built-in tools to generate more morph targets is that we, um, we're not allowed to change the character's topology, so the point counts or point orders or anything like that. Um, but we can manipulate the original geometry in any way we like so back up a level we can see that morph being applied to our figure i can toggle it off and on again you can view the deltas that are required to bring those sleeves up to that to achieve that morph position so to close out this video i've just brought that figure into unreal engine we can see all of the morphs we had generated um, so again we have our corrective morphs for the calf we have our smile morph we have our heavy morph. We have what I call the jump scare morph. Our cone head morph that we created using a deformer in Daz. And finally, our sleeves up morph that we created in Houdini. So I'll end this video here. Um, I hope that was useful for some of you. Um, since I released version 1, I have had uh, quite a few people ask me how they go about exporting morphs um, who either hadn't seen the original tutorial series or were still a little confused by the whole process. So I hope this clears things up for them. And for those of you who are already familiar with the workflow, uh, I hope this um, video has uh, opened up some new possibilities for generating morphs that you might not have previously been aware of. So we'll leave it there. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.